Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast. Coming up. Have you got any weapons on you? And I'm like, no, no, mate, I'm British. Just me razor sharp wit. And he went, good, because I got plenty. He just pulls out this like 10 inch butcher's knife from behind his back. And I'm just like, oh my God. You know, so um, <laughs> I would sort of wondered if I'd ever get shot, but I didn't think I'd ever get filleted. Thanks for having me, mate. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. And I'm so excited about this podcast because you were the first person to recreate the Forrest Gump sort of story. And it's sort of just unbelievable how it sort of all came about. And I, what I love about it is the sort of humble beginnings and how it all started. Uh, before we sort of jump into that, I always like to start at the beginning to sort of try and get a better understanding. But how did the sort of love of running sort of come about? I've sort of always run as, <laughs> as, as long as I can remember. So my first memories of school sport were when I was in juniors. And then... Um, I really, really don't know why this happened, but everybody was wearing a uh, a school running shirt, which was white and blue. For some reason, I was wearing a Ford T-shirt, and I don't know where that came from. Maybe it was like an early sort of uh, attempt to get sponsorship, but seeing as I was only seven, I doubt it. And um, yeah, like, so it just despite the British weather and, you know, the fact that cross country usually involved extremely short shorts and and sort of not getting warm again until Monday morning. So I just really liked it at school. And at my school, at seniors for, for the start, it was either that or rugby. So uh, I'm glad it was running. Because I, for a lot of people who sort of do these big sort of trips, sometimes it's like they're absolutely exceptional and sometimes they just want the thrill of the adventure. For you, your marathon time is slightly ridiculous. It's two hours and 27 <laughs> minutes, which for anyone listening who doesn't know, that is seriously quick for a marathon. <laughs> I'm hoping to actually uh, have, have a, a go at raging against the dying of the light, a.k.a. middle age, <laughs> uh, n- next year and trying to see if I can beat that because now they've got all the fancy shoes out. I am. Um, I, f- I figured I may as well have at least one pop with the rocket boots on. <laughs> Might as well try one before before the body slowly breaks down. <laughs> exactly. And so, I from the sort of start, I know that your sort of big running journey sort of started in Australia, because you're a you're a, a veterinarian. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you sort of were working out in Australia and you had this incredible story about how you almost got to the Olympics (laughs) for a country you you didn't know even from. It was a a bit weird. Yeah, but I was more than happy to switch sides, man. (laughs) (laughs) So, so much so that obviously the ashes is happening right now and like sort of all my like sort of uh, like sort of cricket loving mates are like absolutely mortified. But there's a bit of me um, that sort of is rooting for Australia. <laughs> I was at uh, the um, the Boxing Day test once, and I think I saw uh, like Mitchell Johnson running for a hat trick, and uh, I was almost half support in Australia, want that wicket to fall. But yeah, I lived there for about three years, and I joined a local athletics club because I figured it was probably a, you know a way to like meet mates quickly. And I'd never really done the athletics club thing in the UK, um, mostly just because I, I, I generally like running on my own. Um, but I figured, so yeah, mates could, could join a football team, but I was probably getting a bit old to recover from any injuries. And um, yeah, got a lot better and got selected to run for Victoria in the Australian Marathon Championships, which is part of the Sydney Marathon uh, on you know the, the wider events. So start at the front and after a, a near disaster, um, I, I suffer from very sort of a nervous, shall we say, bowels. And I um, before any marathon, I usually will nail uh, a couple of emodium to make sure nothing bad happens. <laughs> and I would spend the first uh, like sort of hour before the race at the actual course running around like a load of pharmacies trying to see if I could find any emodium. I had to borrow five dollars from the head coach of Athletics Victoria. And uh, but it, it was all right. And I got to the start and I you know cracked on with the main guys. And I think I was in about eighth. 
as I ran over the Sydney Harbour Bridge and it felt like I was just all alone because the lead guys had dropped off the front and uh, yeah, it sort of struggled actually in the race but managed to come 10th overall and everybody was either Kenyan or Japanese and so, you know, I knew about the Australian championship thing but I was only considering being, you know, hopefully Victoria would get a team medal and so I was hoping that nobody in front of me was Australian. And then when I saw like the list and the coach said like I, I was Australian champion, I was just like, you know, I'm not Australian, right? <laughs> and um, he said, it doesn't matter. You've been here long enough. And um, yeah, so I got a nice shiny gold medal. And later on that day, I got a phone call from the head of Athletics Australia. who said if um, they had a few guys away from the race, which is probably the reason why I was champion. Um, who were trying to get the qualifying time. And if they didn't, would I uh, consider running for Australia at the Olympics? And I was just like, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> British citizen down the drain. Oh, yeah, no, too right, man. Like, so I'd, have been, uh, I'd, I'd have been out there now still with the shrimps on the barbie and uh, cracking a few tinnies as England wickets tumbled. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, did you get the call up to the Olympics in the end or I, what happened? I didn't know. Like, I think, uh, I think I was fifth in line by the time they did the selection. And so, um, I, I'd never, I'd never known if, uh, what would have happened if two of them would have got injured, but, um, maybe they would have just took, took the sort of the, the top two anyway. But, um, yeah, I should have sent some hell's angels around to the houses and, uh, <laughs> I, I either caused an injury or said that maybe they should pretend they had an injury. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And so after that, you obviously came back to the UK. Where did this idea of recreating Forrest Gump come from? So the idea had probably been in some sort of embryonic form for, for a while because I'd wanted to run across America for about 10 years by the time I actually started doing it. Um, and of course, when you're looking at routes, you know, you know yourself, you've done one of the classics from New York to San Fran. Well, that probably is the classic route uh, to run across America, either from San Fran to New York or, or L.A. to New York. And so I actually thought about going from Long Beach in California to Long Beach in New York. But while you're looking at these routes, of course, the specter of Forrest Gump is always there, because if anybody talks about running across America, the inevitable line is what well, like Forrest Gump. And so I was looking vaguely at the route, not because I thought about doing it, just because I like to fart about procrastinating stuff. And so if I can avoid doing something useful by looking at something frivolous, I will do. And um, so I knew fully that this route that he'd done was like five times across America, 15,248 miles um, but didn't dream about doing it. And it was only sort of after the Australia experience, because I thought sort of, uh, well, you know, I live in Australia now. Um, why not run across Australia rather than America? It's a similar sort of size country. Uh, and I bought a jogging stroller that I was going to use like, to carry all my gear across, but it never quite happened. And then a job opportunity came up in the UK that basically forced my hand to come back but when I did come back it wasn't the opportunity I thought it was and um so both me and my other half Nadine like we decided to quit the same job and um we had a bit of time on our hands and it was only actually sort of probably now I have even more time to procrastinate and I saw on the internet man completes Forrest Gump run and I for the first time like ever, I was like just absolutely gutted about it. And I, I didn't know why, but then I just thought, well, let's have a little look. And I read it and uh, he'd only done the second leg. So I say only, you know, this is still uh, from Santa Monica through New York and then all the way up to Maine as well. And so that's like, you know, 4,000 miles. But still, he'd not done the first, the third, the fourth, the fifth. And so I just pretty much looked at Nadine and said, we've got to do this because if somebody else is thinking, you know, feeling the same sort of disappointment right now, then somebody else is planning it. And I thought, right, let's let's go from there. And I think we saw that around February. And then I think we booked flights a couple of months later and then that was it. <laughs> 
Yeah, we we had. I t- I suppose it's sort of the importance with some of these things, especially when it comes to sponsorship, is coming being the first person to do it. Yeah. Um, we've had um, Sean Conway on. We've had Mark Beaumont on the podcast who have both done, you know, world first and they do talk about the importance, especially when it comes, because no one remembers the second person. It's always, yeah. ab- it's always about the first, first or the fastest, but the first is usually, you know, the most well known in that sense. And I, sorry. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, and, and the, the one thing is, is what, with something like this, you know, you mentioned that the first, there's a decent chance that it will be the, the only one because, you know, sort of um, something like this, it's so big. And, you know, sort of uh, you mentioned sponsorship. Well, that didn't really help me, mostly because I, um, I you know, sort of from the definite confirmation of we're going to go to going, I reckon must have been one of the uh, quickest turnovers in adventure history. Certainly, I reckon in terms of scale to planning of it you know sort of uh, <laughs> you know the, the scale dwarfs the amount of prep that went into it so yeah no sponsorship for me um <laughs> and the the one tip i would give anyone if they were going to do this would be american and be independently wealthy <laughs> yeah i i think um i think a lot of the time sponsorships especially if it's your first one they don't know who you are they don't know if you're going to make it and unless yeah. you have a track record, they're very, what's the word, reluctant to, you know, put their hands in their pockets and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah here's, here's some money, go do it. Because, yeah. as I say, but I mean, even... Well, especially your- when it's a lone wolf, you know, because, you you know, you, you've got no idea of them. Maybe if you'd worked for that company, they'd just go, oh, no, no, I know Rob, he's absolutely sound. But then, like my proposition like i did actually spend a good bit of time writing letters to uh like a load of fortune 500 companies in the states and i only got three replies back i think from the hundred that i sent and only one of them you could tell had actually read and was just sort of going yeah this does sound really awesome it's just yeah again not enough notice for it you know but because the proposition was so ridiculous it was recreating something that doesn't even like officially exist or certainly, you know, sort of uh, <laughs> not in real life. They probably thought, well, if his proposition's that insane, there's every chance that he's insane. And I'm not sure if we can trust him to be an excellent ambassador. <laughs> now I hope that's a bit different. But um, yeah, I have to come up with a new adventure. <laughs> and so in terms of funding, because you and Nadine went out to start it, how did that all sort of come about with the funding? So we had money that we'd sort of saved up for a deposit on a house. Um, and so that basically became a payment, well, you know, sort of a, on a secondhand sort of motorhome that we sort of gambled on being able to sell at the end and hopefully get that money back. Because um, we got such an old one, I thought sort of all the depre- depreciation had happened, but uh it didn't quite work that way. And <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we, we got some money back. Like, I think we got just under half of it back, but yeah, still not a lot. And then, of course, running expenses on the way. But by the time I'd sort of, um, you know, got to New York, probably I was sort of already out of that particular pot. And then I was raiding some other sort of pots that I had, um, which were far smaller in size. And Nadine had already had to have gone home at this point because um, we well, we just didn't have enough money to survive driving the RV. So at that point, the Australian jogging stroller came out and that was in the middle of Tennessee. And that took me another 8,000 miles in total. We did get sort of um, reunited, Nadine and I, and Jenny, our RV, uh, <laughs> by the time we got back to Minneapolis because I didn't really fancy the wild north of North Dakota and Montana on my own. So um, like sort of on one of the times I had to come back to replenish my visa, pretty much just like work 24-7 to just say, right, I just got to have support on this top bit. Um, you know, if only I could have had a, a little bit of look at my shrimp company, uh, it would have been a lot easier. <laughs> so, I mean, for people who 
you know, maybe watched the Forrest Gump film a long, long time ago or have a sort of not the recollection of whereabouts did you start from? Where does the sort of Forrest Gump journey begin? So I started in Mobile, Alabama. Now, there'll be some people who are fans of the film just going to go, what, you didn't start from Greenbow? Well, if uh, you're real hardcore fans of the film, you'd know that Greenbow doesn't exist. They just made it up for the film. And um, so I, I, I tried to, I looked around for loads of suitable locations, like maybe the middle of Alabama. Um, you know, so I think there's a Greensboro uh, in, in Alabama. But in the book, Forrest is from Mobile, you know, and that's an exact, you know, sort of, uh, and, and Winston Groom, the chap who wrote it, he was from Mobile as well. And so that was also, I think, 26 miles away from Bayou La Battery, so a marathon away from where Bubba was from. So it was a no-brainer for me. Um, I found a house uh, that looked pretty much like the Gump, ball, uh, the boarding house in the film. It's called the Mitchell Bragg Mansion in Mobile. And I started my entire run with three miles from there to the hotel we were staying at. And then the next day it began in earnest. Wow. And so to start with, you were with Nadine and Jenny. Yeah. Well, at the very start, we didn't even have Jenny. So to bear, we flew to Houston. Um, we think we got a mega bus to New Orleans. And then we hired a car uh, that drove us to Mobile. And so we, um, we don't... When we went to Houston, we looked at and we sort of like, you know, we put our name down for that RV, but then we hire card it and hoteled it from Mobile to New Orleans. And that was a sort of a, a lesson in the fact that we couldn't have gone on like that for the whole trip. It was pretty convenient and cool, but yeah, it's such a money drain. And then we got the bus back to Houston and then Nadine got into Jenny. And we were away, you know, all, all 31 foot of her. Wow. And so you <laughs> went from Houston and then, so what's the sort of route from there? It goes. So yeah, like Texas in itself was, was an adventure, you know, sort of, um, if somebody sort of, you know, listens to this and just go, Oh my God, I'd love to do something like that. But, um, you know, I just, there's no way I could run across America. Well, first of all, you probably could, if you're thinking about it, you probably could, or at least walk. Um, but Texas is so great because you almost get the whole of America in that sort of, uh, you know, 893 miles that I did on the on the first leg uh, from uh, Beaumont, which is in the far east. And it's all sort of, you know, swamps and bayous. And then you go through like the mega cities of like Houston and Austin, you know, two very different sort of cities in Texas uh one's all oil and then one's all tech and you know one's republican one's democrat and then you go from austin you go up into like the hill country and then it changes to oil country and then the desert and you get the guadalupe's uh mountains national park which is absolutely gorgeous and then you pop out and it's just desert all the way to el paso then which is an unbelievable city in itself and so from there it was um desert all the way pretty much to uh to la so new mexico arizona joshua tree national park and then uh i got to my first ocean in santa monica uh on the pier which if you know the film that's where forest reached the ocean for the first time and seeing as he'd gone that far he figured he may as well turn around and keep on <laughs> going and i did that i went up through death valley you know so then went right right through the middle got another nip of texas again uh, i think it was only 400 odd miles this time and then um yeah through tennessee went up to the big cities so started off sort of at washington then baltimore philly boston well new york boston and uh, where i did the boston marathon and then up to maine which is the famous lighthouse um where Barkley had finished his uh, run that sort of, you know, lit the fire under my bum to get going. And uh, from there, yeah, I turned around and then went to Chicago. Uh, I had to have a little break then to replenish my visa and came back. Um, then we headed north across the top and then down. Uh, we reached our third ocean because nobody knows where Forrest reached his third ocean because you see it on a map, but it's not named in the film or shown. So... I went to a really cool place called Bandon uh, on the on the Oregon coast. It's just a lovely little sort of seaside town. 
and followed the um, the coast roughly down to Santa Monica, a little bit further inland. I went through, I wanted to run through all the redwoods because I thought that'd be pretty amazing. Um, I got to San Francisco and Nadine had to go home again because of uh, some news we'd received. Uh, and then uh, for me, it was the fourth leg and that took me through the, you know, the classic Midwest America, you know, Nebraska, you know, Kansas, Colorado, um, and I reached my fourth ocean in South Carolina, which is actually where they did most of the filming for Forrest Gump. So I, I ran through some of the locations, including the bridge, uh, sort of, uh, and sort of even managed to hit the ocean, sort of where they filmed the Vietnam scenes. <laughs> and after that, it was just the final leg. Amazing. And for, I mean, God, I mean, that's sort of covering almost like 15,000 miles just there sort of how to sort of condense that but <laughs> i i found in america that it all sort of like how different let's say california is from like nevada that each state has their own yeah. little thing and like the people in the midwest are just unbelievably kind did you have that sort of similar situation all over america yeah, for sure. Like sort of, um, you know, like, in terms of like geography, there can't be a country in the world that sort of matches it. You know, sort of, uh, you know, you got you got bigger countries, but you know, they just don't really have that sort of range in climate. You know, that's really shaped the land. And then, of course, the the cities are all packed with so much history, especially music and film history. So, like, you know, you'd be running through these locations. And then you'll you'll feel like John Wayne one minute, and then like so I was running through LA, and uh, you know the huge storm drains, and like I actually saw this like garbage truck that was driving down one of the storm drains, and I half expected to see young John Connor on his bike, you know, <laughs> riding up the side, and um, yeah, like so the the people you, you mentioned the Midwest and stuff, and because it's not the sort of uh, part of America that a lot of people would visit. You know, sort of, uh, you don't tend to get many people thumbing through the uh, the Wyoming <laughs> tourist brochure, but, you know, you absolutely should because there's just so much to see there. You know, yeah, it might not be the, the famous stuff, but, you know, you get it and, and it's unspoilt as well. Um, it's particularly nice to travel through it really slowly because, yeah, sometimes if you are on the planes and you were driving there and you think, God, this is really boring, there's nothing to see, but that's because you're doing 80 mile an hour. But if you're doing, um, you know, five or six, then you get to see lots and lots of cool stuff. And of course, yeah, people will stop and ask if you're OK. And then you'll be in towns and people will come and sit next to you in a cafe. And the whole have a nice day thing is, you know, like you, you would tend to. I think there's always the British notion that it might be a bit contrived, but it isn't. You know, when people say have a nice day, they actually intend that you go on and enjoy the rest of your waking hours, you know, and the same the next day as well. So um, it, you, you can't help sort of but feel, you know, welcome there, that's for sure. I think some of the best stories sort of happened in like, let's say the Midwest for me, you know, so many times you'd sort of stop in a restaurant, you'd be eating and you'd be like, well, where down that road is, do you think there might be a place I could stop and camp? And then the waitress would be like, oh, give me one second. And then five minutes later, she'd come back and go, oh, come with me. And then she'd suddenly introduce you to a group of people who'd be like, this is the guy, um, sp <laughs> speak to them. And then they'd be like, oh, we saw your bike. We, you know, we saw what you were doing. Um, come and have a beer with us, sit down. And then they give you a place to stay. They feed you. And then the next day they sort of send you on your way. And you sort of think that's a sort of one off, but it happens again and again and again. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. you must have found that doing what you're doing. To, to the point where sometimes you would like, you'd have nothing lined up and you just go into a bar. And of course you would never like sort of uh, like go in there and open the doors and go, I'm here, everybody. Yeah, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but you go in there and you think, oh God, I really hope that someone's going to, say come and stay in mine tonight rather than you know get in the freezing cold tent you know but it would happen so often and like i would always like plan about three days ahead because you know you couldn't really do much more than that really um and you would look are there any cheap motels it when i'm likely to finish no not today what's the weather going to be like it's too cold to camp are there any couch surfing contacts you know, so I mean, if, if there weren't, you'd be like, right. 
And my fail safe, which I ne- my emergency brake glass was post office lobby because in the States, you quite often have them open 24 hours, really remote places. People work at sort of crazy hours. You know, people in America work so hard. We moan at where we're at work, just going, oh my God, the grind. But like, so Americans just like work way harder and they seem to really enjoy it. So they'll go and they'll pick the post up at three in the morning on the way back from a shift. And they almost had a, a, a straggly bearded Englishman on the floor of the lobby, but it never happened because I would just go into a place and sit down. I've never asked for that favor, but I would just, you know, people would ask me what I'm doing. And then I would say, oh, I'm running across America. Uh, where you staying tonight? Well, I was going to see if I could camp around the back of the restaurant or if anybody knew anywhere. And they'd be like, no, nah, don't worry about that. Like, you can go and stay with John. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it happened so much. And and I suppose, like, I, I remember doing my sort of research before I went out. And, you know, they sort of said, oh, well, you can go knock on doors. You could probably wild camp. Is that sort of what you did as well? Wild camped and knocked on people's doors? Yeah, I didn't really do huge amounts of wild camping apart from sort of up in the north because I used to have, even in the rural areas, you know, there's still quite, a, you know, that down south, there's still quite a lot of people about. And the one thing is, like, people are very, very protective over their land. There's no right to roam over there. I was speaking to the American ultra runner, John Kelly, who lives in the UK at the moment. And he is just, like, blown away by the fact that he can just go and run across a field, you know, and he's just like, you can't do that in the States. And um, I met a guy um, called Chris who was walking across America. Uh, I was with Nadine and Jenny at the time, and he had literally just completed his last solo day in in Arizona, and he was going to get crewed all the way into California. And I said, where's your camp? And he said, well, yeah, I'll just knock on people's doors, um, you know, and sort of ask if I can camp in their yards. And so the, the first day I was solo, I... I think I just got a little bit excited and I I left it way too late and it was like dark and it was like, you know, proper like sort of midnight black. And then I knocked on this first house and the guy answered the door and he, you know, he's just like, no, you can't. And I was just like, that's absolutely fine. (laughs) Um, You know, because you're not going to argue. And then I knocked on another one a few doors down and then basically there was no answer for about a minute. And then suddenly the blinds switched and this fellow was just like, who is it? And I'm like, uh, Rob from England. <laughs> because like, so, you know, what, what do you say? Like, so, oh, it's, it's Rob Pope. And he's just, I don't know no Rob Pope. Um, go away. And then, um, well, he didn't say anything else until I'd walked way down his drive because he wasn't coming out. And then he uh, opens the door and he's like, what do you want? And I told him that I was like, what I was doing, what I was doing it for. And, looking for somewhere to stay and could I put my tent up in his garden now like obviously Americans don't even use the word garden they should have been yards so I probably confused him even more and he's like you got any weapons on you and I'm like no no mate I'm British just me raise a sharp wit and he went good because I got plenty he just pulls out this like 10 inch butcher's knife from behind his back and I'm just like oh my god you know so they've um I'd, I'd sort of wondered if I'd ever get shot, but I didn't think I'd ever get filleted. And um, I just said, mate, don't worry about it. I'll just be on my way. And he was like, well, I'll call my wife and see if you can camp behind the local store. And so he goes into the house, comes back out, certainly not had, he didn't have enough time to make that phone call. <laughs> and he goes, it's okay, I trust you, come in. And I'm just like, Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so like he goes in and he's like, You're hungry? And I was just thinking, like, fortunately, I'd seen his little girl. And, it, you know, once I went through the door, it just looked like there was a, uh, you know, very normal family scene there. Where I thought, Oh God, there's no trap door with anybody screaming from below or anything like that. <laughs> and yeah, and he cooked me dinner. Like, he, you know, sort of he fed me, watered me. And then he let me stay in his uh, his camping trailer as well. And so, again, you know, it's one of these things. Fair enough, I two hours previously I thought I was going to get murdered. But it worked out really well. <laughs> Good. And 
And for for your sort of trip, I mean, you were there for what over a year doing this? Yeah, like so the, the it's four hundred and twenty two days of running. So um, and I didn't I didn't have days off. Um, there were a couple of days where I I didn't run. Like so, I lost um, I lost four days to injury, five days to food poisoning. And uh, and a couple of days when when the RV had broken and we needed to get it serviced, but uh, apart from that, it was running every day. God, and how were the legs? Yeah, they're fine. Yeah, they like, sort of. I have to sort of. I'm certainly a lot tighter these days than um the, the, than I used to be, and I'm having to do a lot more sort of self care. Um, and I've been really bad at it these last two weeks because I've actually been running really well and got excited and not been doing my like sort of stretching and my yoga. And then I just got, I'll do it next time. Won't go for another run before I do me stretching. And then like I'm eight miles into a, into a run and I just go, I'll do the stretching in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I coped, I survived. And in sort of the comparison, because you were there for over a year, um, with the visa situation, you said sort of six months. So what, did you have to leave the country or pop up? Yeah, like so my, my first one, because going to Santa Monica, of course, I you know, as we mentioned before, I'd never done anything like this before. And so I had no sort of real degree of confidence that I would do all five legs. And so there was no way I was going to go down to London and spend money on the big visa when... You know, I could have literally got to Santa Monica and gone, I hate this more than anything, you know. And so I did the 90 day visa. And then when I got there, I just thought, right, this is definitely, we're definitely going to continue. I came back to uh, to London, got the six month visa and then headed back out. And then that got me all the way to Chicago. Uh, I had to go back and then renew it again in the UK. Then that got me back to South Carolina. And then it would have got me to... Um, to the actual finish if I didn't have uh, my bonus pause, which was to see the birth of my uh, daughter, which was the news I alluded to in uh, San Francisco why Nadine had to go home. Oh, wow. So you had to fly back for that, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, I actually, I actually didn't have to. Um, I could have finished the, the whole run and probably been back about five days before the birth uh but obviously with with something like this and it's going on and it was hard you know sort of uh, i'm not going to beat about the bush there it was really hard um enjoyable as it was in in the majority but um you know sort of it wasn't just hard physically it was hard financially it was actually hard mentally but i didn't really realize that and um I was just sort of thinking that my mental hardships were due to the financial and the physical things. And so, but it was actually sort of um, the growing realization that the finish would mean nothing to me because uh, Nadine wasn't going to be able to be there. You know, she was there for like just under half of the whole thing and sacrificed a huge amount of self. And of course, we now had like sort of a little girl on the way and she wasn't going to be able to see it. And so, at the very least, I'd have been irritating, at, you know, in the pub or out for dinner when I was telling people my anecdotes. But at the very worst, I think I'd have been really selfish not to have included them there. And so I got to a, a point, it was about 200 miles uh, short of the finish, just just there before Flagstaff. And um, I, I decided I'd, I'd already gone past the distance that Forrest had run at that point. Every time I went home, it was a gamble because there was no guarantee I was going to be allowed back into the country. And it was getting pretty hairy. Sort of, uh, but when I came back after South Carolina, I really thought they weren't going to let me in. And um, yeah, I, I flew back and I thought, even if I don't get to come back, I've still done the forest distance and had a heck of an adventure. But we got back in and like three weeks after B was born, she had a passport and uh, we did the London Marathon on the Sunday and flew to uh, flew to Vegas on the Monday to head back to Flagstaff. And uh, we did the last 200 miles together. Wow. God, that's amazing. And <laughs> in terms of the sort of difference between Nadine being there and on your own, how, how did the sort of... How did the sort of dynamics work in terms of like sometimes when you go with someone else, 
the sort of experience is completely different to when you're own because you have to sort of force yourself into social situations. You have to sort of it, speak yeah. to people, otherwise you become almost insane in your own thoughts. Well, exactly. I, I was very lucky by chance to have those two separate experiences because uh, if if I've had my way, the way I sort of envisaged it, the dream scenario was we go out there, we take the gamble, we buy the RV, we get to Santa Monica, we go to Santa Monica, we bump into Tom Hanks in a bar. He just goes, oh, my God, this is incredible. Uh, I'm going to put you on to my friend uh, who will sponsor you. And then we went across the country and it was great and it was super easy. Um, but of course, that never happened. And um, I, w- I was then slowly sort of flung into the into the wilderness, pushing a three wheeled stroller. Like, sort of sad that the dean was going home, but also really, really nervous because I tore my quad about five days before she was due to go, which was just like not the ideal uh, prep. And um, yeah, when when we were together, like, so we we did talk to people because I am. I am the naturally sort of sociable type and I would make, make, make sure that certainly, you know, we would go out and we, like, I remember having an unbelievable night in a bar called crazy owls just to the East of uh, new Orleans. And this place was like cheers. If anyone remembers the series set in Boston, it's like cheers, but like with a cage and twist. And we got pretty mullered in there. We only went in there to get like sort of a, um, you know, a single beard so we could just basically park in their car park overnight and of course, that beer turned into a lot more. And uh, when you're running, it goes straight to your head. And um, these people were great, but they were that was sort of the exception, the going out. But when you're on your own, you are not. It's not the uh, you're not seeking social engagement, but like sometimes you do want to retreat into your shell because you're tired. But you're forced to socially engage because otherwise, you are just one person on your own in the middle of this huge country and you will basically probably perish. You know? uh, I, I still maintain that I wouldn't have got across the States if it wasn't for the American people, you know, and which has got a very forest message about it, you know? And so I was so glad that in, in the end that it didn't work out the way I'd planned it because the story is definitely better for it. Yeah, I think um, that is what, as they say, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Mm. I always think that with a lot of these trips is you go from A to B and that's always the intention, but actually the stories and the excitement always happens in between and the sort of destination is usually pretty underwhelming. You've sort of done it, you're like, oh, relief. But, But you have these stories to sort of tell yeah. for, for years and years to come. There's very rarely a marching band to uh, signal your arrival to your destination, you know, and sort of uh, <laughs> and the firework display, you know. So you imagine it, you might have it going off in your head, but you know, usually it's sort of you're just there and there's tourists taking their own photos, and you're just like, I've just done this, I've just done this, and uh, but of course you don't say it because that would make you look like a complete gurner. But uh, <laughs> but you want them to just go, wow, have you just gone across America? You just go around me. <laughs> it is so true. You you are sort of there and usually on a beach on your own. And you're like, yeah. I remember when I did it, it'd been like a heat wave throughout the entire time. And then I got to the beach. It was cloudy. It was freezing cold. I was on oh, this no. beach on my own. And I was like, oh, great. I really just want to get out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody loves an anticlimax. And that's why you've got to enjoy the actual, you know, the process of getting there anyway, because if it was just, you know, if you forgot all that. Now, there was a bit I mentioned the torn quad and, and earlier I mentioned the Boston Marathon. Now, my original plan was to, um, well, it wasn't an original plan, but it formed on, on the way. Uh, and I thought, hang on, like I managed to persuade uh, Boston to give me uh, an entry uh, to the marathon. Like, sort of, it wasn't cheap, but I thought it's just going to it's gonna be such a good experience that it would be worth doing. And um, I thought, if I get on my toes, I can actually run and arrive to Boston on the start line, you know, actually get there for the day of the marathon. Then I tore my quad, which put me about sort of, um, well, it was two days of complete rest 
And then I was walking for a good three or four days with tiny bits of running thrown in. So it maybe delayed me by about five days. And I still could have put my, put the foot down and got there maybe on time. But then I was going to be going through all these cities, like stuff, you know, like Washington, D.C. Uh, I wanted to run up the Rocky Steps. But I wouldn't have been able to do any of that. And if I was obsessed with this donate uh, destination at that point in time, I would have got there. And again, nobody would have been bothered because they were all there for their own Boston Marathon experience. And I would have just thought, why did I rush? You know, and so um, I got as far as New Jersey and a local runner um, picked me up and we drove to the start of Boston. And then I eventually would travel back and resume from New Jersey. But even just that journey with, with, with uh, the guy Solomon, like sort of a... Uh, was a story in itself and so you know you shouldn't get obsessed about the figures and and time scales because like they're very really important the only people generally give her monkeys about some arbitrary time scale or oh, i've got to arrive on july the 4th it's only you nobody else really it goes oh july the 4th that's nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think we've spoken a lot on the podcast about how no one cares <laughs> yeah Maybe uh, Mark Beaumont had to stay on his schedule though, like sort of, uh, because yeah, <laughs> eight, eight, eighty, 80 days. days was a fairly figurative thing. You know, he had, he had to make sure he got there. You know, and obviously uh, he had a day to spare. Yeah, he could have, he could have spent some time on the beach. <laughs> I don't think he was in the mindset to do that though. <laughs> no, he probably would have cramped up. He probably would have cramped up, and that'd have been it. It took eighty-one. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think that's literally what we said. Like, no one cares unless you're make Mark Beaumont. <laughs> 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 because you are breaking a sort of timed record but if you're not if you're running across america or cycling or you know down mm. africa mark beaumont's probably broken the record so unless you're going to try and beat him which i think it, when we had him on the podcast he was sort of speaking about how he'd get up at 4 a.m on the dot he'd be on his bike and he'd cycle pretty much till 10 or 12 o'clock at night non-stop and yeah. that in terms of a sort of adventure it's not really it is an adventure in itself but you don't you miss all those moments with yeah you know, the people fortunately he, he'd had the uh the one where he did it solo as well so he had exactly. the joy of doing both of them so he can, he can tick both boxes <laughs> but, uh, my, my uh the, the the record that i had to beat was of course forest run for three years two months 14 days and 16 hours and so there, I smashed that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone wants to hear. <laughs> yeah. So, Forrest completed it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, for uh, like the end, because he finishes, where does he finish? He finishes like in the middle of nowhere and then just turns around and goes, yeah. I think I'll go home. Highway now. 163, Highway 163 in Monument Valley, just over the border in Utah. And um, that's where like, so I, you know, I dreamt of finishing, but I didn't really think that I would have the opportunity to finish there just because, you know, sort of, um, you know, we talked about the, the kindness of the American people being like sort of ginormous in getting me across. But I think luck played as big a role as, as anything, you know, like sort of, um, like, you know, it tore my quads and I was, I was walking and making progress two days later, you know, sort of, uh, like food poisoning. I had, the, I was almost on the verge of going to hospital and, and calling it quits and I managed to get away with it. And then just like so many like little near misses on the way that, that could have, you know, been, been a, I don't sort of really want to think about them too much, you know? Um, I had like a, a huge 18 wheeler in Tennessee jackknife in front of me. And basically came to a stop about 30 foot, you know, sort of away from me. And I would have had absolutely no chance. And so uh, I just stood there and I probably looked really cool to the driver as he was screaming. Uh, and I <laughs> but I didn't feel cool. Because that's sort of interesting because the sort of diet that you must have had throughout, was it sort of nut bars and I burgers <laughs> and chips? <laughs> It was basically sort of, yeah, donuts, chocolate, sort of uh, loads of Dr. Pepper because you've got to stay in character, haven't you? Uh, and then, yeah, like sort of loads of fast food. I, I I had to sort of 
get, do the fast food route generally just because it was cheap. And um, and when I was having my breaks, I didn't want to be like heating noodles up at the side of the road and everything like that. It would have been like probably cheaper again if I'd have done that, but it would have just become so mind numbing. And quite often I would use food as my little, you know, sort of the worm on the end of the, the fishing pole to sort of make me go a little bit, uh, you know, further that day. And I just say, if I get here, I'll be able to have like this specific burger or, or you know, sort of a, a nice, a really nice hot dog at this gas station. Well, certainly when I was going across uh, Utah, uh, there was a bit where there was no services or anything for like 70 miles. And I knew there was a gas station there and gas station usually always means hot dogs. And I was like almost, hallucin- I was almost seeing like mirages, like sort of in, 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 in the salt. Um, yeah. And then when I got there, that hot dog was suitably priced for somewhere that's in the middle of nowhere, but I didn't care. <laughs> God. And for, um, for the end, you were sort of there in Utah with Nadine and the kid yeah yeah and baby lots girl. of other people as well yeah yeah and then, her name's b b uh so b e e and um yeah like so we we named her sort of uh well i say we named her nadine named her when we were in idaho and uh we didn't know that it was going to be a girl at that point in time and um and so she was actually going to call b leith um as in the sunshine on leith um song by the proclaimers and it was really quite freaky because I'd had a day where I was uh, like Idaho's like Scotland on steroids. And I was sort of obsessing over the proclaimers and this like sort of um, song comes on and I play it over and over again. And then I come in and tell Nadine and she's just like, that's really weird. And I was just like, why is that weird? And she was just like, because if we're having a boy, I wanted to call him Leith. And I never even heard that as a name apart from a place before. So, uh, yeah, that, that was my only regret that B was a girl because, like, that would have been a great backstory. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> when she told me she was going to call a B, I wasn't overly sure about that to start with, but I love it now. Oh, good. And as you say, was was the feeling like? Was it sort of slightly underwhelming? You'd sort of been back for so long and then suddenly you had two weeks left. I suppose you probably yeah, just wanted to, this, the sort of feeling of yeah. wanting just to get it over. Not really, like sort of, um, because it had gone on for so long, and sort of, and and you know, everything was going fairly well at this point, and so it was like such a ginormous goal. Like I remember, like sort of uh, speaking to someone who'd gone across America before, and he said, like he spent like the first ninety percent, sort of almost like wishing it was over, and then the last ten percent, desperate to claw it back, you know, sort of, and, and for it not to be over. But it was one of the rare occasions where the climax wasn't an anticlimax. I've had a good few of them. But um, to be honest, like almost every ocean for me, like w- w- was always like sort of a good one because there was always going to be something else. So it was still, yeah, it was like a mini celebration, but it didn't have to be like grand. Um, like so much so, like sort of, um, I-, I could have quit in Chicago because it was like my favorite American city. And I'd always wanted to visit there. And I thought, wow, oh, got no money, sort of, I'm, I'm injured, sort of, you know, maybe it'd be great to quit here. But then it was always that thought of being in Monument Valley than sort of, uh, you know, doing the bit for my two charities, the World Wildlife Fund and Peace Direct, that drove me on. And I got to the end and I got to deliver the line. And then I got to turn around and, um, with Nadine sort of being there, it seemed as good a time as any. Was lucky I had a, ordered an engagement ring from a little jewellers in Brooklyn and had it posted to Flagstaff and uh, it all came together. So I, I had a little thing in reserve to make sure that it didn't end up being an anticlimax. Unless you call married life an anticlimax. <laughs> yeah, married joke. <laughs> well, at least you got it. So it's definitely one that you will remember for the rest of your life, that sort of moment. Yeah, it could have been, it could have been uh, remembered for a different reason if she'd have just said, "No, Rob, this just isn't what I want." Like, oh God, I'd have had to have carried on running. Then. Like, I'm just going to run up there and finish there, so I don't have this memory. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd have just had need to get a new pair of Nike Cortez, put them on, and then just gone for it. Maybe then I would have done the three years, two months, etc. <laughs> Amazing, and wow. 
And so after that, you sort of came back. So this is what, year 2016? Uh, that was 2018 then, yeah. Oh, so it started in 2016 and sort of that was, a, yeah, it was April of uh, 2018. It's just starting to get hot in the desert when we came back. We got out at the right time. <laughs> Give me one sec. I just need to check the camera. Um, oh, wow. Well, I mean, this, it, it's just the most incredible story and one like the most incredible adventure as well. You've sort of been up and down. Did you have a particular favorite state? Because you've been North and South. I can't comment on the South, but I love the North and they're very different from what I hear. Yeah, they diff different but similar. You know, like the the, the states just you know, it it is a bit crazy that, that you know we see the politics there at the moment. But like, sort of, it's unsurprising that there is that sort of argument because like even California and Oregon, you know, you got San Francisco and Portland, but then in between it's like super super rural. But you know, like I I don't know whether I prefer the remote bits or the built up bits. You know, sort of um because you you would get different stories in all of them. But like I do have a real soft spot for Tennessee uh, because um that was a state where I went solo for the first time and I didn't have any expectations of Tennessee apart from the fact that I got told there were a load of packs of stray dogs there that would probably savage me. Um, and I didn't think Dolly Parton was going to come out and run any miles with me. So, uh, so I wasn't really anticipating in any great measure, but that was when I sort of maybe started to get the inkling that things could be all right. And like, you know, I, there was just like an, almost like a little tidal wave of, of support that happened after I got a really cool news article and, you know, people would shake my hands and there'd be a $20 note in it. And they, I'd be like, Oh mate, I can't take that. And they'd be like, I think the word you're looking for is thank you. And I'd be like, all right, fair enough, you know, and, uh, and it's a really beautiful state, but then, you know, I'm saying Tennessee and then I'm just thinking, Oh God, like, but sort of, you know, like Washington was really cool. And then so was Maine. And then like, you know, um, uh, going through like death valley and and nevada like i would certainly encourage you having been up north you definitely need to do a southern one and so um or i reckon the route of my um like first leg would have been really really cool to to do on a bike you know you don't even get many hills you get to cross the rockies at the lowest point you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i remember cycling up the rockies although actually the rockies weren't that difficult to cycle up believe it or not Okay. It's all very gradual. It's actually the yeah. Well, I suppose right the north, it's not too bad, is it? You know, sort of. It's when uh, you decide to do the the really evil bit in the middle of Colorado. I I, I saw that getting smashed by snow as I was uh, was going through Wyoming. And I was looking to my right, and I was just sort of seeing. It. I was just like, I'm so glad I didn't go that way. <laughs> For me, it was I'd sort of been told because my at the time when I went, my American geography was pretty poor. And so they're like, oh, well, once you're over the Rockies, it's all downhill to the sea. <laughs> and then you get into like Nevada and then you've still got the Sierra Nevada. Nevada. Wow. Like, who, who told me about that? It's like this. It's the steepest. The oh, I'm not even yeah. going to swear how much it was, but it was horrific cycling up. there. <laughs> it was like a vertical. I used to have to like stop, drag my bike up. And I went up like one of the like most in comparison to the others like the tamest and it was brutal in comparison to the rockies yeah and i said like, i i did i didn't expect that in the bar at all and the one thing is it's it's less you know severe for a runner than someone on a bike especially a loaded bike so i do feel your pain man <laughs> <laughs> retrospective love <laughs> well I, th I think uh there were many times where i was on my bike very glad that i wasn't running so it swings and roundabouts. <laughs> Downhills. <laughs> yeah, that's always the joy. <laughs> well, Rob, is worst thing for me was having the stroller and like sort of uh, my brakes slightly rubbed. Oh, yeah. And so uh, I would generally disconnect them. And then I would forget about that when I was going down like a massive hill. And then suddenly I'd find I would be like doing like sub five minute miles on legs that were not capable of doing <laughs> sub five minute miles. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, it's just, it's just an incredible. And so probably Tennessee is your favorite. 
was was there a good story other than the um one where you had to go knock the, on his yeah. door? <laughs> the, the the near murder. <laughs> um, well, there, there was one of them actually. Sort of um, is is probably my favourite story that did didn't make the book. There's a really um a cool town called Cookville, and uh, probably no one's heard about it, but it's sort of in between Nashville and Knoxville, and it's where we stored Jenny when uh, Nadine had to go home. And I was approaching uh, Cookville that day. I was with my stroller and I knew there were like huge storms on the way. And so I, I ran past this like really like sort of, you know, almost like it wasn't a shack, but it was a fairly sort of small, modest weatherboard house. And there were two little girls like sort of playing out uh, in, 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 in like the front yard. And so they rushed and got their daddy and said, can we give them an apple and an energy drink? So they came out, they gave me that. They were just really nice. We had to chat. And then I went on. And this is like all rolling fields, but I knew I could feel this storm coming. And I basically got to the RV place. Um, and my plan originally was to actually just put some stuff into the uh, in, into the RV, take some stuff out that I now knew I needed to be solo, and then go and get some food over the road and then probably stay in like one of the motels there. And so um, I went over and tried to get out of this storage yard, but it was a weight activated gate and I couldn't get out there. And this is just as the heavens absolutely opened. So I could see all this fast food. And I was just like, oh, my God, I've got nothing in my stroller. But then I went back to the RV. And even though there was no like, sort of power, we still had gas. And there was like noodles and stuff that was left over there. So I ended up having this like romantic dinner for one um, that sort of uh, Nadine sort of would have been involved with. But uh, And then I got a message from, um, from Steve and the dad of these two little girls. And they were just like, sort of, oh, my girls are really worried about you. They were just like, he does got an umbrella, don't he, daddy? He's got an umbrella, don't he? And that was just like, even at that age, it just, you know, the kindness was there. And so I went to sleep that night and sort of, um, you know, in, in, in the bed in the RV, like, so a free stay, which is great. And I wasn't, it felt like I wasn't breaking any rules if I couldn't get out. And, uh, and like, obviously the pillow still smelt in the Dean's hair and stuff like that. And I was like, oh. Why isn't this made the book? This is romance. <laughs> Too many good stories. That's the thing. <laughs> that's the problem. There's uh, usually so many to sort of talk about. Well, I, I think actually, you know, when you say that, like with, with Tennessee, that's why that story didn't get in because like so the editor was just like, man, I'm doing it. And just saying this really nice thing happened. Then this really nice thing happened. Then this really nice thing happened. You need to have ups and downs. Like <laughs> Otherwise, Tennessee is like a rocket ship to Mars. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a story of amazing times. And, you know, yeah. every, every good story has a conflict <laughs> along the way. Exactly. And I did get chased by that pack of stray dogs by the end. I did. Yeah, yeah that's they good. Did, they, did, they, did, they didn't get me. They didn't get me. <laughs> Uh, never, never the fun has been uh, chased by a bunch of stray dogs. Yeah, no, it's probably even worse when you're on a bike as well, because if you just haven't got enough speed, and then you know you run the risk not only of uh, of getting nipped, but also coming off the bike as well. Well, I was going to say it's probably worse for you running because you you're trying to outpace a bunch of dogs. Yeah, but I can just I I I, I would turn around and shout at them and I. I this one actually went for me. I just basically wheeled my stroll around and sort of the dog like bounced off the side of it. And I just thought, you know, it's quite nice to have that there. And then, then, then I could uh, reach for my pepper spray. And uh, if he came again, he was going to get that, but he never did. I think he thought better of it. <laughs> <laughs> Once you show your dominance. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob, it's been such a pleasure listening to your stories. Uh, there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. Um, cool. With the first being on this trip, what was the one gadget that you always had with you? Wow, the one gadget and stuff. I, I was it would have it would have been my MP3 player for sure. Um, and so uh, one of the saddest days on the trip was when it stopped working um, and. I looked down to see like what song should have been on and it was the Smiths. Heaven knows I'm miserable now. <laughs> if it was if it wasn't for music, I think I might have actually gone insane. Yeah, I, I always find uh music along the way um always helps because you, you spend so much time alone with your thoughts and sometimes that's good, sometimes they have a 
sort of time to sort of run away and so actually having music to sort of listen to also probably speeds up your running a bit well exactly i I had a rule that uh basically if acdc ever came on i wasn't allowed to walk so (laughs) it would always happen at the most inopportune moment like at the start of a massive hill but um you know sort of uh it it certainly got me going (laughs) that's always a good one uh what is your favorite adventure or travel book so I, yeah, I thought about this sort of the one that maybe got me sort of thinking about sort of a adventure is quite a strange one. It's because it basically isn't about a person's adventure; it's about a dog's adventure. Um, and so it'd be Call of the Wild by Jack London. And so uh, it's the story of like sort of a like a a, a dog that uh, is sort of almost kidnapped to become a sled dog and then has like this sort of crazy sort of a dramatic life in the wild sort of north of the uh, of america in the yukon you know i didn't get that far north but i did leave san francisco uh from a bar called the first and last which is where jack london actually wrote that but uh in terms of human adventure the first book and probably the most sort of uh well-read adventure book I've got is actually Mark Beaumont's The Man Who Cycled the World. And I I kicked myself when I uh, met him that sort of I didn't actually take the copy for him to sign because it's so well-thumbed, he would have known that I've read it <laughs> and it would have actually really been a pleasure to sign it for him, I imagine. When you were in San Francisco, did you go to uh, the Bubba, Bubba Shrimp? I did, yeah. Like so, I, I I've been to the one in San Francisco, the one in Vegas, the one in New York. Oh, you went to the all one of in them. New Orleans, yeah, and the one in Biloxi as well. So uh, there's a, there's a few more that I haven't <laughs> ticked off yet. But uh, the good thing was was uh, in a couple of them I did get free feeds as well. Oh, that's quite nice. <laughs> they must have loved your yeah. story. Oh, exactly. And like, cause um, they quite often will have somebody who comes around and um, and will ask you questions on the film while you're having your dinner and stuff like that. Um, there was there was quite the uh, the face off in New Orleans one where the only one I fell down on was uh, my shonky knowledge of the U.S. presidency chronology. So, oh wow, <laughs> I think that would probably get us all. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think I think it got four out of five, which is probably more than most. Um, what, are, why are these sort of adventures important to you? Yeah. yeah like, so I don't actually think they are, <laughs> um, you know, sort of, um, I, I enjoyed sort of, uh, the adventure, um, but it was the, the right thing at the right time for me. And I am keen to do more things. Um, but generally sort of um the adventure that sort of i want to go on isn't necessarily uh for me it's if, if i can do stuff that is good for my charities then that then that is great you know so if i want to be not the thing i want to be a cog in the thing that sort of helps and i am able to do this kind of stuff like run a long way and uh, now maybe I've got a bit more of a presence. It might even be a bit more sort of, you know, useful for these guys. And so, but I think sort of there has to be an adventure in every one of us. You know, you don't necessarily need to spend all your life adventuring, but I think everybody would be far richer uh, spiritually if they did experience sort of the ultimate freedom of the, whether it's the road, the trail, the mountains, the desert, you know. That's one of the good things about America is you can experience sort of all of it. And there's also a little bit of a safety net by the fact that it's so very civilized on the whole, you know. So um, you don't necessarily have to go, right, I'm going to do an adventure. What what, what am I going to do? And then thumb through, you know, sort of the, the big almanac of adventures and go, I'll have that. Because usually the adventure will find you. You just have to be ready to accept the adventure when it happens. Very nice. Yeah, I think. Um, and what was I going to say? I can't remember. I, I had it on the tip of my tongue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bugger, completely forgotten. <laughs> That's all right. We can come back to it. <laughs> um, what about your favorite motivational or motivational? What is your favorite sort of quote, travel motivational quote? I think this probably would be quite appropriate for for people who travel on adventures because remember adventures 
are only adventures if they are adventures, you know. So if you plan something to the nth degree, the adventure aspect does sort of, you know, then then it becomes a holiday. You might not think it's a holiday because you're really tired doing something, but if nothing's left to chance, you're not going to get the same sort of excitement. So it's a quote from my granddad, which is, you die if you worry and you die if you don't. (laughs) So why worry? Very true. Worry about the things that you uh, can control rather than the things you can't. Exactly. You know, and then just get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's, a, that's a good one. And uh, finally, people listening are always keen to sort of travel and go on these sort of big, grand adventures. What's the one thing you would always recommend for people wanting to get started? Stop putting obstacles in the way of your yourself, you know, actually achieving something, you know, sort of it's really easy to find excuses and excuses aren't the, the bad thing that they're continually made out to be. But if you find that sort of um, one of your excuses disappears from view, don't invent another one to take its place. Just like sort of, you know, it's a bit like sort of, you know, shooting down the ducks in a fairground, you know, sort of once you've shot one off, don't put another one there because you'll never win the teddy at the end otherwise. Yeah, that's pretty good. And finally, what are you doing now and how can sort of people follow you in the future? You've got a new book coming out. There it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know how that got there, (laughs) you know. (laughs) So yeah, Becoming Forest is out from all your major bookshops and online and everything like that. I'm trying to get people to ask their local independents to shop it, uh, to stock it. So we can keep the high street alive and all that. Um, and so the book actually comes out on February the 8th in the States and I'm aiming to actually go back out and get myself back to Monument Valley and stand at that point where sort of I did utter those famous words and then turn around and, uh, keep on going maybe to one final ocean ah very nice and it's it's out in the uk at the moment it's out in the uk yeah came out in october and sort of um and it seems to be getting really well received and remember it's you know there's something for everybody in it's not just a running book there's enough for the runners in there but it's people who are fans of adventure in general american culture sort of you know the american people you know amazing sort of travel landscapes uh there's some very nice photos in there and um of course if you like forest gump <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of forest uh, wisdom in there which i uh occasionally hope to share on their social media as well so you're more than welcome to follow me on there which is run rob la run r-o-b-l-a very nice did it take quite a lot of research watching the film over and over again Oh, for sure. Yeah, they sort of, especially the the actual seven minute running scene. Like I've probably seen that running scene maybe two hundred times now. You know, mm. just trying to work out exactly where bits were. If I was doing filming, you know, so I wanted to try and recreate that scene. Um, but you know, I don't think you can fail to just love the film once you've actually seen it. And, you know, in a year when Shawshank and, and Pulp Fiction were its contenders in the Oscar race for it to have won shows how good it is yeah it'll probably be on over christmas it always is <laughs> no it's, it's it's very good very good film and well for for people listening and people watching we'll put a link to your book in the, and your social media in the description below so amazing you thank click you click on it and have it just in time for best book ever fact <laughs> have it just in time for christmas oh wow the timing <laughs> <laughs> perfect well rob it's been such a pleasure listening to your stories and i cannot thank you enough for coming on today thanks so much for having me mate it's been a lot of fun well that is it for today thank you so much for watching and i hope you got something out of it if you did hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you in the next video